order. And welcome, uh, Mr. Cochran. Thank you. <sighs> The lights better, in here, sure. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Hoffman. I work for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, last time I chatted with you was last week. We talked a little bit about the framework for um, state land use planning in the state. And I also talked about um, the state designation programs and incentive programs to kind of build stronger communities and downtowns. Um, so my division provides the tools, training, and grants and incentives to keep our communities strong and healthy, particularly our traditional centers. Um, today I'm here to talk about this concept of enhanced designation, a designation that would overlay over some changes in jurisdiction. Um, we can make the state designation programs and activity more effective. And, and do, I think, a better job supporting our land use goals and compact centers surrounded by rural lands. Chris, did you, oh, we have this submitted to us? Yes. Okay. Um, so does everybody know the Act 50 creation story? Have you gotten that? I think we've gotten that. I can do it quickly. Yeah, the interstate highways were built. This is a picture in Brookfield, Vermont. Um, I don't know when I drive in the interstate, it's always, you see those kind of stone walls caught in the median. Um, well, this is what it looked like in Brookfield before the interstate went through. Um, with, by connecting Vermont to the interstate highway system, um, big metropolitan areas like Boston and New York City had access to the state. Um, um, we had it. People loved what they saw here. They liked our outdoors, our landscape, our, the recreational opportunities. And there was a boom in population, a boom in second home growth. And um, this is what was going on. Does anybody know who this guy's name? Yep. Five yeah. bucks. Yeah. Davis. Davis. Yeah. Dean Davis. Um, ironically, maybe, I don't know, uh, he was a Republican governor. Um, and the southern part of the state was going crazy because the second home development was happening willy nilly. And local communities didn't have the zoning and bylaw protections um, to manage growth and plan for development in a way that was effective. Um, so he and a Republican General Assembly felt a lot of pressure to do something about it um, um, and to help these municipalities who just were, weren't prepared for this kind of population growth and types of development the, part, the, the, the southern part of the state were seeing. Um, they created a commission called the Give Commission. They did a bunch of conversations with people, and what they heard was people really liked our traditional settlement pattern of compact areas surrounded by rural lands. What they were very concerned about was um, sprawl and kind of the stripping out of the areas between our traditional centers. They wanted to do something about this. They wanted to help the municipalities um, um, get ahead of kind of the development challenges. So the re recommendation was, um, and this was adopted in, Act 250, uh, in 1970, was Act 250. Ten criteria, you know, projects have to meet all the criteria, they have to apply, if they don't meet the criteria, they're not gonna get a permit to construct. Um, We've talked a little bit about Act 250 jurisdiction. Um, this is not all the jurisdictional criteria for Act 250, but this is just kind of a high level. Um, but it basically aims to get the, the bigger level projects. So um, projects that impact more than 10 acres, more than 10 units, depending on if the community has subdivision regulations or not, the thresholds are lowered. Um, well, this is good, and, and we heard testimony over the summer that Act 250 does a pretty good job um, you know, improving or mitigating the impacts of larger scale development, it misses a whole big chunk of development um, because it's the way its jurisdiction is set. Um, where, and this is a little bit of the point I want to make t today about enhanced designation, municipalities now, re most of them, review all development. So their jurisdiction is complete, whereas Act 50 is just catching a small percentage of very large development. This is a picture of um, communities with, with zoning in 1974. Maybe a little hard to read, but you'll see, I guess the point is that there's not a lot of infilled areas. And then this next slide, we'll see kind of how far we have come. Um, and this slide on the far right is communities with um, zoning 
um, subdivision regulations or unified subdivision regulations. So in these communities, um, Act 250 jurisdiction is much, much higher. The point of these slides is, you know, a lot's changed in 50 years, and our communities and state level permitting um, has improved significantly. And this is just a quick reminder about in the 1990s, late 1990s, um, 1998, the downtown program was created. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, it took a different approach to supporting our land use values. Um, rather than a regulatory scheme, it was more of an incentive based. You know, how do we provide you money and tools and resources to help you rebuild um, your downtowns? Many of our downtowns were struggling. Um, in 20 years, we've come a long way. Um, designations came in different times for different purposes. Um, the first was the downtown designation. There's 23 of them. They are principally our large communities like Montpelier, St. Johnsbury, Bennington, Springfield. Um, then came the village centers, which is a much, much smaller area. And if you recall from my presentation last time, they're you know, really, really tiny areas that we designate. Um, new town centers came after that. We look at these as kind of our core designations. Uh, the, the middle part of the egg yolk, if you will. Um, and then subsequently, additional designations were created um, because the health of the neighborhoods and the areas around them and how well they integrate and, and link together is an important component of our kind of settlement pattern and our community vitality. Um, one was focused on improving um, neighborhoods, the quality of our housing in and around our neighborhoods and providing development incentives and regulatory incentives to improve them. And the other was the growth center. These last designations are not um, as active as some of our others. Village centers, we get you know, five new, usually every time the board meets, so it's a, it's a very active program. Um, Say that last thing again. Hmm. You get five new village centers? Every time the board meets. Yeah. Which is how often. It varies. We, um, we, we scheduled, this is the downtown development board, it's scheduled to meet monthly. We, if we don't have anything on the agenda, we don't meet. Um, um, but we typically meet between six and eight times a year. Yeah, uh, 30 a year. We're going to run up. You're going to have every town will have one. So we're, we're getting close. I think we're, yeah, we're at 157 now, um, villages designated. Um, um, this Richard Amore, the staff person, does a great job doing community outreach, and they're really actively taking advantage of the program and kind of not this committee's jurisdiction, but I know you like talking about other people's jurisdiction. <laughs> the tax credits that support these building improvements, um, really it's the growth in the village center program that's kind of driving a lot of our demand. And, the, and that's the interest that the village centers have is to get those tax credits. That's really their only benefit at this point. Um, the others are, are, are more planning and regulatory focused. You know, I can give you a whole list of kind of the requirements and benefits. I think I did, in fact, give it to you last time. Yeah. You know, what you need to do and care of here's what you get for it. Um, this is um, some work that was done in Essex um, looking at our at Vermont's permit uh, scheme. It was an audit of kind of the process um, that what, what a housing development needs to do to get a permit. Um, um, I, I think there's opportunities to make it better. Um, I think you've heard testimony so far that you know um, our land use planning at the local level has improved. Our state level regulations have significantly improved. Our federal regulations have improved. Um, I think um, what hasn't changed in 50 years is the way Act 250 recognizes um, these other improvements. So because of the you know the jurisdictional trigger based on impacts, you know, 10 acres or 10 units. Um, a project in Berkshire, Vermont, gets the same treatment that a project would in Burlington. Um, even though Burlington has, you know, significantly um, um, a high level of staff, um, sophisticated regulations, um, both communities are treated differently. So I think there is an opportunity to recognize kind of this local capacity um, and um, without 
kind of harming our environment in any significant way. Before you move mm -hmm. on this slide, help mm -hmm. us understand the arrows connecting different permit types. And what is this slide really showing us? We have seen it, or I, I don't know how many, we've seen it a couple times. And yeah, I didn't generate the slide. Um, um, but what it's showing is the process, um, the permits that you need to um, get a housing development permitted in Essex. Essex. Um, so the local permits that's needed, um, the process is in loops if somebody appeals, um, the state level permits that are required, and then the Act 250 permits that are required. And it also shows um, you know, what happens if appeals happen in any stage of the game. And you'll see there's a lot of feedback loops. You know, if, if you get your local permit um, and your state permit, and there's concerns or Act 50 modifies your permit in some way, you have to go back to square one and mod start with your existing local permit again and get that modified and amended. So and I think the black lines are saying those are areas that cross over. One permit mm -hmm. might meet the criteria. So you have these A&R permits mm -hmm. that all go to waste disposal, for mm -hmm. example. So that even though your Act 250 approval is based, it, it's not a new permit. It's using, it's based on a permit. It's from a presumption, A&R. right? Yeah. Right. And the red lines are mm -hmm. the appeals. So what happens if someone appeals that particular permit? Where does it go? So obviously, like all those ANR permits, right? They get appealed to the Vermont Environmental Court. So you see this red column, but it's all the same state. And I didn't draw it. <laughs> so. I know. And I don't know. Who, I mean, we got it first from Ernie Palmerlow. Yeah. And so I don't know the actual genesis of it, but it would be interesting. To I would. That. Charlie Baker's shop, Sittenton County Regional Planning Commission, I think is the one who developed it, it, but they may have done it in concert with Ernie. Seeing a no nod mm -hmm. in the audience, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll find that out. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Dolan. Is this um, permitting flowchart the same, regardless if you're in the designated downtown, You a anticipate my next or, question. Um, not um, a yeah. Um, I'll get there, I promise. <laughs> but great question. Um, in fact, the next slide. Um, so, we a, a number of years ago, um, um, I, a group called Smart Growth Vermont worked on the growth center provisions, and um, um, they got a provision that where Act 250 jurisdiction recognized location. And this is a lot of the conversation that you guys have been having. That the location is a better determinant of impact than 10 units and 10 acres. Um, the name has changed over time. What now this provision is called is called Priority Housing Projects. Um, it adjusts Act 250 jurisdiction in the designated centers. So downtowns, new town centers, neighborhood development areas, and growth centers. It does not um, affect village centers because they're too small and just don't have the capacity. Um, what it says is because we have a need for housing, and this, this is for certain qualified mixed use or mixed income housing projects. If you have one of these projects in one of these located areas where we said we'd like to grow, um, you do not have to get an Act 250 permit or amendment to build housing, affordable housing, in a downtown area. Um, it's a little different for these other designations. Um, if you meet the standards, if you are building um, a qualified mixed use or mixed income project within a new town center, neighborhood development area, or growth center, you do not have to get an Act 250 permit so long as you can satisfy the existing conditions um, that Act 250 issued with that project. And the reason for this um, was that a lot of the Act 250 conditions, um, I guess for example, would conserve land for agricultural purposes within a new town center. Um, you know, these areas have sewer and infrastructure, and you know, is that the best use of that resource? You know, can we get more value out of these existing areas where we want to grow? Um, can we build on that land? Can we modify these permit conditions? If this is the right place, this is where the state says they want to see housing and development to occur, can we open up these conditions and let the project go forward? Um, so it's been particularly effective. Um, 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 
Um, it's supported almost 600 housing units in these designated centers. Um, we did um, a study a couple years ago and talked to all the people who got these permits and asked them for, you know, how much time do you think you saved in fees? And they have a pretty good idea of what the fees are because of the fee schedule. And we asked them how long do they think they saved in permitting time. While the fees are not super significant, what developers really valued was the t you know the ability to get into construction more quickly. You know, when it gets cold in Vermont, we know, and construction season, if you have to build in winter, significantly adds to the cost of construction, 10 to 15 percent, sometimes more. Um, what they also really liked was there was no risk of appeal. Developing in a center, there's a lot of people you have to make happy um, because you have a lot more concentrated users and intense uses. Um, so the fact that, they, that this provision allowed development to occur without the risk of an Act 250 appeal was the major benefit. Um, appeals and is, I think, the cost of appeals, and we, yeah, you can get information on this, um, you know, it typically just gets rolled into the cost of the development. And usually the person who wants to buy that house or rent that apartment has to has to pay these costs. So we took testimony mm -hmm. from the Vermont Housing Conservation mm -hmm. Board. How many of these units would be also counted in their housing that they same, reported to us? Same. same. Cause, right, because most of these things have to meet affordability criteria. And so VHCB would have been involved in a lot of these things. Yes. Representative Smith. Yeah, no, I was just trying to understand <coughs> the permitting process and uh, you know, priority housing projects, it, it appears that there's no permit or amendment to mm -hmm. permit, but in order to get that, that site to begin with, did they have to go through a, a permit process, or are we just talking about renovation of existing buildings or renovation of uh, an existing site? Well, yeah, so, so um, you know, Act 250, once Act 250 jurisdiction attaches, it's, it's forever. It doesn't change. Um, and a little bit of the, the genesis was that you can have a, pro a parcel right next door with no Act 250 permit and kind of build the same project without having to um, get an Act 250 permit given these priority housing project provisions. So that's why we wanted to allow people to amend the conditions. You still have to get all your local permits and you have to get all your state permits. Um, so projects are pretty well permitted. What you don't have to do is go through the Act 250 process. Um, the size of the number of units for priority, priority housing projects is scaled to the size of the community, recognizing the local capacity and ability to regulate these developments. Um, so for communities over, um, I think 10,000 in population, so these are our largest communities, I think there are seven or eight of them, um, there's no unit cap. If they want 200 units of housing and they've done the planning and development and sort of support their, their goals, they do not need to get an Active 50 permit, whereas traditional jurisdiction would have been triggered at 10. Um, it scales on down to smaller areas based on their population, and I can get you information on that. But the yeah, we have a couple. Mm -hmm. Representative Dolan, then Dave. I'm um, just interested. Th this is fascinating, and important information, and terrific to provide that uh, designated downtowns that support. I know that designated villages have the same <coughs> interest for housing and concentrated development in their designated areas, um, and and yet you breezed over that. Point. Mm -hmm. um, can you go back a bit and just describe what are the barriers for villages to try to uh, so, accomplish the same objectives mm -hmm. if we were to mm -hmm. expand this um, priority housing for uh, smaller communities, sure. smaller um, rural areas? Good question. I'm surprised you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of what we're trying to recognize in, in priority housing projects and the enhanced designation concept that I'm going to talk to you more about is um, communities with solid regulations and the capacity to regulate, you know, um, and the capacity with water and wastewater systems to support our compact development um, um, 
we should recognize this in our permitting framework. And that's the biggest barrier in our smaller communities, um, that they don't have staff. They have a part-time zoning administrator. Um, they do not have water or wastewater systems to build out in the dense development pattern that we'd like to see. Um, um, and those are, those are the primary kind of barriers to why um, we're mostly we're looking essentially at our larger communities with this existing staff and regulatory capacity. Um, there is a path for villages in our enhanced designation proposal, but it, it sets out expectations of staffing, wastewater, um, bylaws, etc. cetera. Um, I think communities in your jurisdiction could meet it because you have um, some wastewater capacity locally. You do have pretty good staff. Um, and again, these are going to be voluntary programs so the community needs to decide if they want to take these steps. Um, it comes with requirements. You know, you, you don't get, you know, you don't get dessert without eating your vegetables. So, um, but we have the bill and we can share that later. Representative Fave. How are these designations either created or expanded in very small towns that have maybe no more than a gas station or a post office at their center? How are they created? Um, the way the process works is um, a person from my team, a gentleman named Richard Amore, has a community meeting. They usually talk with the select board and local planning commission. They talk about the benefits of the designation. There's usually some interest in fixing up a couple of buildings in the town. He, we have a statutory requirement of a definition of what the village is. They walk the village area and they say, you know, this is your core commercial village area. This is what we would recommend including within the area, and this is what would be out. I understand the village is mm -hmm. being a, something inside a town. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, so that's right. town that has the right. governance, not the village? Well, it's going to vary, because you do have villages that are independent of, of towns, oh, but yeah. Okay. Okay. But I guess to your point, it's not the whole community. We're just designating a small, mm -hmm. tiny little piece of the community, the commercial core, the traditional center, where your post office, your church, your store, your gas station, kind of those buildings are. We're not doing the whole community. That application is usually helped um, put, put together by a regional planning commission. Um, then they come to the Vermont Downtown Board, the board reviews it and approves their designation. Once they're designated, then they're eligible for tax credits and technical assistance from my, my team. Did you say designated it? The Downtown Development Board. Um, and the board's comprised of um, a lot of um, state agency heads, um, municipal representatives, um, um, the NRC and the Preservation Trust of Vermont have a representative. I think in some of my earlier slides, there's a graphic that showed all the people who sat on the board. Representative Forgate? The no permit is no Act 250 permit. Um, if you've got a mixed use, such as Wilson Block and mm -hmm. does that, that's not just housing, that's housing and commercial and right. whatever. Right. So that's not exempt from... Well, it's, it really depends on the project. And we'll kind of get into the next slide. Okay, um, that's good. Um, so to determine if jurisdiction um, is necessary, <coughs> you're go through active, you have to get a, a review from a, a regional coordinator, a district coordinator. Um, and so they use these definitions for rental owner unoccupied definitions for mixed use to determine if the project um, qualifies for a special jurisdiction. Um, I don't know what happened with the Wilson Block. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm just thinking, how big a deal is this if it's only for housing? Because, like in our designated downtown, there's not a lot of space mm -hmm. for just housing to occur. Um, I'm kind of getting at some of my other slides, you know, about, you know, the environmental yeah, impact in these yeah, centers. Let's, and, let, let's yeah. let Chris keep going and um, see where we go. Um, um, but this is the process for modifying existing permits, um, active 50 permits within centers for those three communities. Um, this is page one of the flowchart. There's two pages of the flowchart. And, and my point in all this is we, we can make this work better. Um, I think we have a good opportunity here to make development easier within these centers when, but while still protecting our environment. Um, and what kind of gets me to, um, what is the mantra of realtors? Is there anyone? Location, location. Location, location, location. And this is really kind of where um, I think 
the administration and um, many other folks would like to see Act 250 consider location as part of jurisdiction um, because the impacts vary significantly depending on where you are. Um, this is just me being silly. I always have to have an animal slide. Um, the administrations and other advocates are interested in a balanced approach for jurisdiction where, um, where jurisdiction is lowered within areas where we'd like to grow and increased in areas with critical resource values. So it is a balanced approach to jurisdictional changes. And the fundamental question is, you know, Act 50, where would we like them to review a project? Or we'd like to review them in a rural area where there are <coughs> important natural resources, um, or would we like them to do more review um, in a downtown area where you know, it's covered with impervious surface um, and they're just not the significant natural resource impacts there because they just don't exist. As one is critical human habitat area, um, the others has potential to impact um, the environment. And to me this question, it's a simple one to answer. Um, if Act 250 with limited staff time and resources, I would much rather they review rural development and um, rural housing development like this. Um, I think that's where the protections are needed, and we don't need the same level of protection within these centers. Um, and as everybody knows, if you haven't heard, you know, Act 250 doesn't catch a lot of these projects. Um, and so we're getting a lot of this rural sprawl that does fragmentate, fragment our forest and habitat areas. And the reason this is happening is because it's cheaper and easier to develop in these areas. Um, so we need to figure out how to make it easier to develop within the areas we'd like to grow, and perhaps a little harder in areas outside where we don't want to see environmental impacts. Um, this is some data from Bennington. Where's my Bennington rep? There you are. Yay! <laughs> <Yeah, yeah, yeah. laughs> Um, Bennington has a growth center, and every five years they have to report to the downtown board kind of how are things going, how's your designation working. Um, the goal of the growth center designation is to, to direct as much development as possible, I think more than 50% of the development within the growth center, and discourage development outside of these areas. Um, so this is data from, from Bennington. Whose goal is that? It's the goal of the program, and ultimately the, it's the community's goal because they come to us and say, we want to do this. 50-50 is the goal. Is, is the target. Um, most 50% of, I think it's, Jacob, is that right? I'm sorry. Uh, majority. Majority, yes, 51%. <laughs> Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Um, the goal of the growth center program is to concentrate development within the growth center. And the statute says uh, the majority of growth should occur within these centers. Bennington came in um, with their data, and I think it was 80% of, of all new growth in that last five year period happen within their growth center. So it, it does work. Communities can do this um, if we give them the right path and the tools to achieve this outcome. But the point of this slide, um, we got permit data from them as part of that process. And this, this compares Act 250 jurisdiction within Burlington, uh, within Bennington, versus local permit um, jurisdiction. And the point here is, I think one we all know, but I, we all, um, I need to hammer it, is that Act 50 only catches a small slice of development within Bennington, whereas local jurisdiction reduce all permit development, or all development. And there's a huge benefit to that um, if we're trying to tackle things like climate change and forest fragmentation, because we're looking at everything that's being developed, not just a small subset. Um, th this is town-wide. It is and then I just need, I have two people with questions, but one rewind the percent in Bennington of development that's happening in their downtown it, within their growth center, 80 percent growth center, 80 mm -hmm. percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I've represented Bates and then mm -hmm. McCullough. So, my question, real quickly, is where did our putt <coughs> block fall under? Was it back to 50 or is it just the local? I don't know. Um, if Putnam had to get an active, you know, they're still trying to get, you know, their, their financing sets, they may not have gone through their permitting process yet. Um, huh. 
That's odd. Mm -hmm. One other thing, then where would I go to find out really what's happening with that project? Because um, I hear one thing from the state, then I hear one thing locally, and neither one of them are, are matching up. Someone's lying to me. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, I hope nobody's lying to you. I would talk. Oh, they are. Yeah. <laughs> I would talk to. Um, who's the guy from the RPC down there? Um, Bill Colvin. Yeah. Yeah. I think he probably has the most current information, or, or the developer, um, um, from Brattleboro. Where's he? Uh, Bob, Stevens. Bob Stevens. Okay. Yeah. I think that is the best source. Of information. Not the state. Um, you could get information from the state, but I think I don't know where they are in the permit process, so I would start with them. Okay. Thank you. So, so yeah. Chris, um, we got some testimony last week that that um, some of the various towns have such rigorous DRB mm -hmm. and, 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 and town plans that Act 50 doesn't really get involved or need to get involved. Um, and yet, I'm making the assertion that in this case, and um, in my own town of Wilson, mm -hmm. which also has a growth center, um, where the majority of the of development takes place mm -hmm. there, and we do have rigorous town planning, that um, one can't say, which is what I sort of thought I understood you to say, um, so disabuse me of this idea. Um, one, one should not be just assuming because all this planning is going on that Act 250 isn't needed in that community because I see projects in our community that slip through um, below, you know, just below the 250 threshold. Um, yeah, they're, you know, they meet the, the, um, death by a thousand paper cuts mm -hmm. that the town requires um, and yet they're poor planning mm -hmm. um, so it, you, it'd be hard to really comment on that without the some more facts about the specific project you're talking about no not uh, yeah and I don't want a specific yeah. project I want just the 10,000 foot view of how act 250 could better work with towns with really good oh zoning and planning and not okay. to dismiss the need for right. Act 250 in those communities right. So we're getting to, you're getting to my next point. Okay, you, guys, you guys are really awesome here. Okay. Making my presentation for me. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to I talk about. I can hold about. my water. And yeah. it's, we're talking about enhanced designation, where, where Act 250's jurisdiction recognizes all the good local planning at the local level. Um, and we ask communities to upgrade their bylaws so a state level or state concerns, environmental protections are addressed at the local level. Um, so, in the wake of Tropical Storm Irene, we learned a lot about flooding. Um, in my last presentation, I talked about how a lot of our downtowns and village centers, our traditional cells, our areas are at risk because they were built on water, because that's where the power and transportation was. Um, what enhanced designation proposes is river corridor protections upstream and downstream of our centers. Um, and allowing infill to occur within these centers. Say that again. So um, what enhanced designation <coughs> proposes is um, town level adoption of river corridor bylaws. Um, the river corridor standards say, you know, you shouldn't develop in these areas, you know, where there's a high flood risk, but it allows infill development within a settled area because they're typically um, the rivers are armored, they're stable, they're not moving anywhere, there's just not a, not a high risk of flood. We'd much rather see the development occur there um, than happen um, out in the rural areas. Or we'd much rather see, um, you know, developing in certain areas of the river corridor actually increases the risk of flooding and harm and potential to the settled areas. So let's concentrate the development in these areas and discourage development outside these areas. Representative Odie, when you say infill development, you're not talking about filling land. You're talking about in between things that already exist. Right. So you've got two buildings. <laughs> They're both kind of set back from the river at the same amount. Um, They're set back from what? The river, or river corridor, at the same amount. Um, 
stopping development between those two buildings when you're already having the system set back isn't going to make the community any safer. We're not talking about filling the site, um, but you can build that building in a way that it's protected from the flood. Um, and that's um, what we're talking about. Low line areas, but that's a lot different than having a village that has this kind of density in those mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of villages with that. <laughs> that's kind of a, a, a vision of Vermont that quite is, <laughs> we're not quite here. Okay. Um, right. But that's, the, that's the example in Rochester, you know, up the stream in Northfield, you know, they lost buildings, they created a park, you know, there's opportunities to do that. Um, um, but given right now, I would much rather see a development happen in a center versus a development in a floodplain that somehow makes, that increases the risk to not only the community downstream, but all the communities downstream. So let's be a little bit more strategic in how we support well, development. It, it looks like mm -hmm. this. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe this isn't real, but it's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it looks like the center was mm -hmm. in, this, in the floodplain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our communities are. I mean, mm -hmm. most of our communities were set up with a mm -hmm. power source close by, mm -hmm. and yeah. that was the river. But there's a lot we can do upstream. You know, a lot of times, you know, farmers build ber mm -hmm. berms, you know, to protect their, their ag crops. Uh, from flooding, um, they're on floodplains. You know, are there opportunities to work with the local farmers to say, you know, in the event of a flood, can you know, can we remove this berm and compensate you for storing this flood water that is going to protect, you know, our settled areas? Um, you know, Representative Dolan's old program did a lot of investments to restore floodplains, so we minimized or attenuated the flood risk to these areas. So there, there is an approach. It just, it's not going to be quick. Um, but enhanced designation gets communities thinking about them. Climate change is real, it's going to happen. We need to get communities to start thinking about this and making changes. And what enhanced de designation does is provide an incentive and framework to encourage these kind of thoughts. But they're not, these are 50, 100 year conversations for how we change um, and adapt. Mm -hmm. But d just to mm -hmm. put a fine point mm -hmm. on it, your proposal isn't to increase infill in those river corridors in our villages. It's to <coughs> floodproof existing investments and increase infill outside of those. Corridors. No, it's it's to do it's to floodproof existing historic buildings. The river corridor procedure um, <coughs> allows basically you know mapping of the river corridor area. Um, they're just kind of broadly cast right now. What we're proposing is is some kind of analysis to say you know you know. Where is, the, where is the safety area um, and allowing infill to occur in those areas? So some infill would be allowed. It's in not just the river corridor. It's consistent with you know the river corridor procedure. So not closer to the river, but no. But with filling in, right. okay. And so I've heard you say mm -hmm. your proposal includes townwide river corridor mm -hmm. zoning, and you're talking about we need to do something upstream. Mm -hmm. What about the forest, forested areas that are really the insurance policy for all of this? The proposal looks at, like it's a balanced jurisdiction um, within centers and increasing jurisdiction outside centers. I think you're going to get testimony from um, Billy Coster at the end of the week. I see the two as, as paired um, about how to protect these areas um, from development, from fragmentation. Okay, but your proposal doesn't have that in it yet. It's, it's in the administration's <coughs> bill. Um, I'm here to just talk about the enhanced designation component of it, but I absolutely agree that they are linked. Um, um, you know, we want a, 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 again, a balanced approach to reduce jurisdiction in centers where we'd like to grow and increase jurisdiction in areas with important natural resource values. But I'm not the expert in natural resources, so I'm gonna let A&R talk to you more about that. Um, <coughs> but. A little bit, you know, these little tags in the bottom are kind of linked to the Act 250 criteria, and kind of not directly, but you know, enhanced designation would bring resources. Um, I can get through this, just a few more slides, um, I promise. Um, brings resources to protect our historic buildings. You know, aesthetics is an important component, and historic preservation is an important, important component of Act 250 review. Um, it will improve. Erosion control, because again, all projects um, are going to be subject to a higher level of local erosion control bylaws, whereas Act 250 would only catch a few and bring them up to these high standards. Um, it'll support kind of some of the goals we want with complete streets, because the communities are going to be required to have you know, capital development plans to figure out how we can get more 
bikes and buses and bike lanes in in our settled areas. Um, um, again, capital planning is required. We want to make sure that the community has the water and wastewater resources to support any development within these areas. Um, but it's also important to note that these, these projects still need to get A&R permits. You know, they still need to get local connection permits. They still need to get um, all the permits. What we're just talking about is, is um, jurisdiction adjustments for Act 250. Um, here's a good example of kind of some of the benefits of <coughs> local jurisdiction versus um, state jurisdiction or uh, state level Act 250 jurisdiction. I'm not picking on Barry, but this is a project that was built in East Barry. Um, it's a Dollar General store, and I'm not picking on Dollar General. This is just, this was uh, a building built kind of on a rural road. The local zoning allowed it. Um, it's kind of minimally improved. It is a box with a light and a parking lot. Um, it met the local standards. It was built. This is the Dollar General in your town? Yep. Um, um, Bennington, S same business. Um, but the local guidelines, um, the design review standards within the designated center ended up with a better product. Um, now a little bit about important natural resources within centers. This is one thing that Act 250 aims to protect. Um, we envision um, bylaws protecting these things if they're located within these centers. Um, but we did some analysis with BioFinder, and there's there's not a lot of habitat area within these centers. There's not a lot of big risks to the environment because these areas are largely built out. They're mostly paved and covered with buildings. Um, here's a picture of Montpelier. This is from BioFinder. Um, there's some important resources, uh, natural resources within the river corridor. Again, we would protect these areas. Um, you know. Um, this important riparian areas that they provide um, for, for critters moving up and down through the community um, would be protected. Are those the little the red polygons, or I honestly couldn't tell you what. I think it was a there's a mussel in there that's being flagged, <laughs> and it are a rare threatened endangered mussel. But don't <laughs> quote me on that. But somehow the green is. And I'm <clears throat> colorblind, so I'm even really in an even worse spot the here. But polygon <laughs> yes, on the right side. so <clears throat> let me just say we looked at, and we didn't find a lot of rare, threatened, endangered blobs <laughs> showing up in our designated center. So we should wait to hear from Billy on this. Um, yeah, Can we talk about downtowns and natural resources. Um, I think his focus is um, going to be on um, unique resource value areas, um, but. You know, I'd be happy to give you additional information. Kind of when we look through, um, we sat down with um, Fish and Wildlife to look at the natural resources within these centers. Um, we didn't find a lot, but we asked them to give another look to make sure um, we weren't. You know, nothing would be impacted. Again, um, if they were identified, if there is a rare, threatened, endangered species, or if something important is identified, we would have bylaws that the community would adopt to protect them, to avoid and mitigate harm to these areas. Um, but there's not any important headwaters or streams, you know, not a lot of mass production areas that we could find within our designated centers. Representative McCullough has a question. Yeah, uh, um, I want to go back to, mm -hmm. to the uh, example of the Dollar General. Mm -hmm. Um, built outside of the community and again to that happened because it met the town's mm -hmm. requirement likely because it was underneath the acreage requirement Absolutely, for the yeah. development right. and and so yesterday we heard about tyranny of the tyranny of small decisions, mm -hmm. um, and without the oversight of Act 250, um, the Criteria 9L was never could never be considered mm -hmm. here. And if it had come under the jurisdiction, it likely would have failed. You know the commercials. For all it, it could have. have. I mean, we don't know how the, how, how the, the, we can't say that mm -hmm. with certainty. Mm -hmm. It's, it, so I just say likely. Mm -hmm. We don't know who would have won the Saints game 
yeah. either, yeah. Um, for, with certainty. But I'm just, I'm just bringing this out yeah. well, to help us all understand that maybe we need a a, a, a better combination of action mm -hmm. fifty oversight yeah. with our community. Would you? Could you, would you? And that's a little bit of what we're talking about yeah. here. You know, yeah. we're all trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Can we get the communities, you know, Active 50's goal is to support our compact settlements. Yeah. The state designation program's goal is to support uh -huh. compact settlements. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a good job, um, but right now it's more expensive to develop and there for a lot of reasons. Um, if we can ask communities to raise their standards, um, can we make it easier to develop there by changing jurisdiction within these centers so they don't have to get an Active 50 permit? Um, again, we have a lot of other permits that, that look at these projects from the state level and from the local level. Um, um, I think we're feeling pretty confident that the environment will be protected and this is a better way to support our land use goals. Um, but oh, I wanted to, the last thing uh, as far as, you know, 9L, you know, Act 50 often says, you know, all of our projects or a high percentage of projects are approved. So it's hard to say whether 9L would yeah. um, say no. It may modify that project, but it, it may not actually say no. So mm -hmm. that's the one thing I want to mention yeah. there. Thank you. Dolan and then Odie, mm -hmm. and then we have to let Chris finish. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick observation, <coughs> just to, mm -hmm. to follow Representative McCullough's <coughs> comment. What those two mm -hmm. examples told me is, once again, um, when you focus this kind of enhanced designation solely on our medium to larger communities where they have the, you know, the, the designated downtown areas, for example, with the, the various um, um, criteria, uh, you can make an a impactful outcome. But here in that East Barry example, it illustrated to me once again that rural communities are mm -hmm. suffering from the similar um, potential outcomes of fragmentation and mm -hmm. sprawl of um, non-concentrated uh, development in where you have the services dilemma. And I only flag that mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's, again, paramount to evaluating how we can provide that same uh, support for our rural communities. Jurisdiction is the key to everything, you know, who is reviewed and but, but they may not necessarily have the, the, the resources or the infrastructure, such as wastewater and wastewater, to follow, the, but still suffer from the same potential <coughs> outcomes. And I flag that because yeah. it's absolutely critical that we provide that same kind of uh, incentives for our rural communities. Representative Odie, I'd like to ask. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Where have you seen communities with standards that would prevent the Dollar General where it is? Um, any of our growth center communities are going to have pretty high bylaw standards that don't support that. Um, okay, so if, that, if those are those standards, then how do they get shared with the communities where that happens? Um, it's a conversation with the regional planning commissions, I think. They provide a lot of the local services to help communities update their bylaws. Um, we have a project right now we're working on with Vermont Housing Conservation Board and the Realtors um, and AARP to kind of get housing friendly bylaws in communities. Um, um, so it's many people can provide these services, but really the regional planning commissions are kind of in the best position to support municipalities to improve their bylaws. The community has to want to make these changes, and that's that's the key. You know, some people are going to see that kind of development and think it's good. Um, so it's important to <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, so uh, just a few more slides. Um, again, you know, we do see a lot of wildlife in our centers. Um, arguably, we see that because we're losing habitat outside our centers. Um, ANR has a proposal to increase jurisdiction and protections for critical habitat outside these areas. Um, but we don't see a lot of this critical habitat within our centers. And while we love our farms in Vermont. Um, you know, things like conserving ag soils within centers doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially when you've got a sewer service area. You've made a huge investment. Um, so we'd like to make sure that um, you know, we're getting the biggest bang for our buck for our utility investment. And finally, you know, Act 50 looks at schools and school capacity. Um, I think it's a big topic in this building. A lot of our schools are you know, decreasing in size. Um, so I don't think, you know, 
the scale of schools and, and rapid growth of schools is going to be an issue in most of our designated communities. Last slide is the, um, you know, the slide on floods. Um, we know another flood's coming. It's just a matter of time. I think by um, asking communities to um, update their bylaws to meet higher environmental standards, to meet state goals, um, because their local jurisdiction reviews all projects is the best way we can help communities adapt to a changing climate. Um, it does a whole lot more than a criteria change in Act 250 would, because Act 250 only is going to review a few of the projects that trigger jurisdiction, and they're only going to be the larger projects. <coughs> Last slide, and I think I made it on time. Um, the administration does have a bill, and we do have language that supports all this. Um, you know, when you're ready, I'd be happy to kind of walk you through a lot of the details. Um, and I hear you, Representative Dolan, we do need a solution for rural areas. Um, and I don't have it, <laughs> so we can talk more. But, um, you know, more resources are needed. There is a capacity gap. And until we figure out how to fill it and support them, are we going to see the changes that we'd like to see? That's all I got. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Representative Odie. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I'm concerned about is, mm -hmm. is, um, is it's important to have space in an mm -hmm. urban setting, too. Yeah. There's nothing wrong, I don't think, with having not just parks, but mm -hmm. no. wrong with a few goats in a, you know, in a small field. Yeah. I, I just, um, I would... I don't disagree with you. I think the point I'm trying to make there is often um, um, there's a nine, criteria 9B says you need to conserve ag soils on site um, for certain types of development. Um, it's a requirement of Act 250. Um, a lot of times when these sites are conserved, they're not used for farming purposes. And it's essentially, you know, it's a, it's a mowed field. While well, there's a benefit to that, if there's a, if there's a park or something like that, if it just sits there vacant because of an Act 250 condition, I'd much rather see, you know, a building going there. Um, but it's not to say we need to completely urbanize our centers and you know tear out all the parks and build buildings. There's most of our communities do have large parks and green spaces and areas to plan for that. And that's kind of some of the things that we're thinking about in you know, the capital plans where you know, where can people recreate within the town. So all right, I gotta <laughs> yeah, one quick question. Um, I as I understand the regional planning commissions uh -huh. can provide that support to rural communities. And they're underfunded. Um, under they're entitled to receive Everybody's some funding. Everybody's underfunded in the statutory the, formula. Yeah. From the property uh -huh. transfer tax, would uh -huh. would enhance funding for them to be able to provide the co regional capacity to help rural towns uh -huh. with that help. I think you should need to talk with them about that. Um, I do think they're interested in receiving additional funding, and maybe that's something you could say. You know, this is what the needs are. Um, that what you mentioned this morning, um, VHCB's very program. Uh, a ready program, I'm sorry, um, could help a lot of these rural areas um, as far as grants and technical assistance to get projects going. Um, but everybody who's funded by the property transfer tax is statutorily reduced. You know, here's your funding, including the municipal planning grant program. So it's um, they're not alone in this challenge. All right, All right we're going to take five. Let Kate get set up. Thank you so much. For uh, thank you. Me. I hope this helped. We're really ready for your. Um, Language. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's um <laughs> and a very civilized meeting that is with, with snacks provided. All right, good morning. Um my name is Kate McCarthy. Um thank you very much for inviting me here to talk also about enhanced designations. Um this is my first time before this committee this year, so um it is nice to see and to meet all of you. Um, I am the Sustainable Communities Program Director at the Vermont Natural Resources Council, and as you may have heard, but I will reiterate, we're a statewide environmental organization, and we work for um, to keep our human and natural communities strong. And really, this Act 250 conversation is about those questions of how do we have a strong environment as well as great places for people to exist and thrive and build the economy. So VNRC has been involved in Act 250 conversations since before Act 250 was created, and then more recently as an advisor to the Act 47 Commission. Um, you heard last week from our executive director, Brian Shoup, and he presented you with a high-level overview of some of the main areas we're looking at that we see as opportunities to modernize Act 250 and make it work better for everybody. 
So I'm here today, as you know, to talk about one portion of those recommendations and the bill that's before you, and that's those enhanced designations. So I'll talk a little about my view of what the problem is we're trying to solve. Um, you'll hear some similar things to what Chris just discussed and maybe some different ones too. Um, and then I'll talk about my, um, my view on the elements that really needed to be included in an enhanced designation program if it's going to really work to achieve our overall goals. So just by way of brief background, um, when I say that I'm the Sustainable Communities Program Director, what, what is a sustainable community? It could be a lot of things. Um, for me, it involves promoting our villages and downtowns, fighting sprawl, and um, also fighting resource fragmentation, our farms and our forests and our natural areas. So um, as you know, this, this approach to our settlement pattern, how we develop where on the land, has environmental benefits because it keeps our resources healthy. Um, whether those are working lands or, um, or, uh, or forested areas that help with flooding. Um, it also means that if we have our homes and our services and our schools closer to one another, we've at least got the option to drive less, and that's really good for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So there are environmental benefits to smart growth. Um, but just as importantly, it's an approach that can really help um, communities thrive, and it can help people's quality of life by providing a range of housing options that are affordable, a range of transportation options that allow you to get out and about and not have a car if you don't want to. Um, so that, that's where I'm coming from when I say sustainable communities, and it plugs very well into Act 250. Um, it also plugs very well into our state's long-standing land use goals. And you know, the one right up top is to promote, on, um, promote our historic downtowns and villages, these compact centers surrounded by rural and working lands, and avoiding strip development. So, so that's where I'm coming from. And that brings us to the problem that we're trying to solve, which is that um, even though we value the feeling of these places, we value uh, the history that is part of them, and we value the outlying areas that make Vermont, Vermont, um, you can't deny that it's more challenging to develop in a village, to develop in a downtown. And there are a lot of different reasons. There are existing buildings there that you have to work between or around. There are polluted soils, tight space to work, um, maybe a lack of infrastructure um, that, help, that challenges different scales. And so it's cheaper to build in an undeveloped field. That's just the way it is. Um, but we really care about promoting those downtowns. And so this, um, this is a, a way to start thinking of doing that. Um, the Act 47 Commission's report, right up top, concluded that when it comes to our state settlement patterns, it asked this question, are we meeting our settlement pattern goals? And it concluded, not really. Um, and so, that, so that's why we're here. The problem that enhanced designation is attempting to address is to simplify at least one piece of that puzzle of developing more successfully, more easily, more predictably in downtowns and villages. And what we're talking about is these areas that have done the pre-planning and are truly development ready. So this ties to an idea that you've heard a little bit about and you'll hear a lot more about, and that's the idea of um, locational jurisdiction. It rolls right off the tongue. Um, but it's, it's the idea that instead of the scale of the project or the number of lots triggering Act 250, you look more at what's the under, what are the underlying resources there? Are, they, are you developing in a place that stands to be really harmed and changed by development? In that case, maybe you should scrutinize it more closely. Or are you developing in a place where there's already a lot of pavement or there's already a lot of development and infrastructure? Maybe that should be a little easier to do. Um, today, those areas, those types of areas go through the same type of review. So locational jurisdiction is a way of saying, let's apply the appropriate level of scrutiny based on the underlying resource. So I know you've heard that. Uh, I think it's very important, so I, uh, I repeat it. So um, VNRC. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking that locational jurisdiction could make it easier through an enhanced designation. Um, and I'm thinking we're, we're thinking about making it easier in compact um, uh, settlement areas. But I'm also thinking the flip side of that is locational jurisdiction can really apply in, 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 the, the, um, in other areas um, to, 
to better understand for, for developers and owners and, 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 and the, the um, regulating community to better understand that maybe the locational jurisdiction here and enhanced designation programs, if they're separate, I'm not sure. One's a concept and maybe another's a program. Correct. Um, it's going to be more challenging to cite in, in, in some areas. So there's a flip side. I'm thinking a flip side to mm -hmm. what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? That is accurate okay. in my view of okay. how this should be approached. Yes. Good. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so in general, we, we agree that this idea of an enhanced designation makes sense. It builds off state programs that are known and that have been very important to our state. Um, and we think that it makes sense if certain requirements and processes are in place. So, so that's what I'd like to do next, is share with you five elements, five things that are on my mind that VNRC believes, strongly believes, would need to be in place for this enhanced designation to work. So the first of those items is exactly what Representative McCullough just mentioned. Um, it's our strong opinion that enhanced designation or creating this enhanced designation program is not a standalone act, not a standalone change to Act 250, but that for it to work, for it to really create the overall development pattern that we wish to see as a state, there need to be complementary protections in important natural resource areas and outside of these smart growth centers. So. We need to talk about not just Act 250 inside centers, but Act 250 outside centers. They really do go hand in hand. And VNRC's support for the enhanced designations is, is related to and contingent on getting it right in the outlying areas. So I know you'll be hearing a lot more about this topic as, as soon as this afternoon from my colleague Jamie Fidel. Um, and you will hear about those outlying areas and what it means to develop thoughtfully in those areas. <coughs> So that's, that's the first thing that's really important to us for the enhanced designations to work. Um, second, it's our position that the process for becoming an enhanced designation has to include adequate protection for natural areas inside the designated area. So one thing that's useful to remember as we talk about using the designation programs for different purposes is that at their origins, the village and the down village program and the downtown program, those lines were drawn around areas where the focus was economic revitalization and historic preservation. And for that, the programs have been successful. But they weren't originally envisioned as land use planning and new development programs per se. That's for villages and downtowns. For growth centers and new town centers, those were envisioned for new land development. But um, there's still more probably that, that we want to be aware of when developing in those areas, which may include undeveloped land. Um, so that means that the process of enhancement um, kind of adds a layer that looks at the land use planning elements, that looks at um, what's on the ground in terms of natural resources. So in many cases, there may not be natural resources present. We saw the map of Montpelier just now, and there aren't a lot of hot spots um, in downtown Montpelier. Nevertheless, we want to make sure that whatever process there is for enhanced designation does ensure that, a ta that when there are those types of resources, a town is looking at them, because we don't want to presume that they aren't there. So in other words, making a place development ready doesn't mean that every portion is developable. It means that we're doing the planning ahead of time to make sure that the right areas are developed. Okay. So um, third, it's our position that um, the decisions by the Downtown Development Board about enhanced designation need to be appealable. There needs to be an opportunity to, to question the results if they do not meet the statutory intent. And to VNRC, appealable means um, appealing to the Natural Resources Board, perhaps professional board, um, with appeal rights beyond that to the Supreme Court. So this would ensure due process, which I think is, is quite reasonable when you're talking about an enhancement of, that removes regulatory oversight. Um, this also means that you're, you're getting people's input up front in the enhanced designation process. Ideally, there would be no appeal because there would be a really good process where everyone understands the implications for the enhancement. But in the event that it, it is not smoothly done, um, there does need to be that, that option. 
Okay. So the fourth item is um, VNRC really sees this as a very focused program. Um, we don't believe that the enhancement should extend to areas that are planned for growth, so areas that, outside of growth centers anyway. Um, there may be some areas that towns consider their future growth areas, but they don't have any sort of um, state designated planning done for them. We also, um, and, and that's because these areas planned for growth, they vary tremendously throughout the state. There are some that are next to highway interchanges. There are some that are, are not in good locations. There are others that are very good. So um, we don't think this should extend to areas planned for growth. We also don't think that it should apply on a town-wide basis. That would kind of defeat the purpose. There may be towns who say that because the town is more sophisticated in the planning and zoning realm, that they should be enhanced throughout their town and relieved from Act 250. We, we don't agree with that. Um, so finally, and this, this gets us into the weeds a little bit, but I think it is important to point out, it's our position that the conditions of existing Act 250 permits in designated areas need to be upheld unless there's a compelling reason to change them and a process to do so. So um, what, what this is about is that even once areas received an enhanced designation, you may have some buildings or properties within the enhanced area that have old Act 250 permits on them. And those permits may have been granted with conditions to ensure that the impacts of the project are minimized. Um, those might be specific hours of operation or they might be screening for landscaping or something like that. Um, and we think it's really important that those carry some weight because it may be that people nearby, whether neighbors or other community members, rely on those conditions, that they got involved and said, this project is great for the community, but you've got to have this condition. Um, we want to make sure the enhanced designation doesn't simply wipe out those existing permits. That would take away due process. But we are open to a process um, where those, those permit conditions are honored and only modified if a careful process that maintains due process is followed. Lots of process. That's how we make sure we get it right. Um, and there are ways to do this so that you can really examine a condition and say, is this relevant? Is this applicable? Is anyone <laughs> relying on this condition? Uh, is, have, they, have they placed their reliance on the condition? Then there can be a conversation about it. Um, of course, we have talked in this process about how even if in the enhanced designated areas, Act 250 doesn't apply, local permitting will. So between those two could be a way to ensure that conditions are maintained for the reliance of, of any who are involved in the project. So those are my five things that are important to me about enhanced designations. Um, I really do think that thinking about jurisdiction based on location has the potential to help us meet our goals in a more uh, direct way, in a more intuitive way, when the regulation that's applied makes sense for the underlying resource. And I do believe that enhanced designations could be a workable approach, but only if we adequately protect outlying areas, um, if the natural resources inside the designation are protected, the decisions are appealable, and co existing conditions are honored. Thank you. Um, who has the power to determine if a project should uh, receive an enhanced designation? So I think that's going to be part of the conversation and decision making by this committee, but it would be, right now designations are granted um, by the Downtown Development Board. And in determining whether or not to grant a designation, they follow certain criteria. Statute lays out what the requirements are for a downtown and a village and a growth center and a new town center. Okay, is, is that based on a town plan which in turn has been approved by the Regional uh, Planning Commission? That's one of the ingredients, yep. yep. So how is it appealed if you object to it and, want to, and didn't like the decision mm -hmm. of the, uh, the development board, where would mm -hmm. you go from there? Um, our proposal is that you'd go to the um, professional board, the natural resources board that is envisioned in the, in the bill. And it, if, is your question also, um, what might you appeal about the enhancement? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what is there not to like to, to contest? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, if you, let me think of, of a good example. If you feel that natural resources are not adequately addressed by the town's bylaws, so if we're, if we're envisioning a future where that area has no Act 250 review and a neighbor or someone in the town or, or an agency thinks that the town bylaws actually don't address natural resources enough, 
but it gets approved anyway, that could, it could be appealed on that basis. Another example is um, if you have a growth center, those are the most geographically expansive of our designations. If the growth center is very large from the 2006 designation and the enhancement should maybe, in order to accomplish planning goals, be smaller, but it's approved to be the whole growth center, um, that, that the boundaries of the enhancement could be appealed. <coughs> But it's, it's my hope that it would not happen often, um, but in the interest of just providing a mechanism to assure that statute is followed, uh, I think that is that the appeal is important. And were you talking about, can we distinguish between what's happening now yes. and how it might work under an enhanced designation? Were you sure. asking about yeah. both? Yeah, yeah. so what, what's happening now is, as I described, where the downtown board follows certain criteria mm -hmm. that to see if the town's taken the steps right. to be ready to develop in that area. And they get a lot of really great staff support from the Department of Housing and Community Development. The town doesn't show up with a piece of paper and have the board look at it. It's, it's a process of making sure there's a lot of coaching, and that's very positive. Just gonna, but isn't a lot of times the dis town's decision driven by economics? I mean, they need that. I don't mm -hmm. like, maybe I don't like Dollar General where they're going to put it, but mm -hmm. yet I understand sure. if the town is struggling to uh, mm -hmm. get new revenue and add to its tax base, then, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm probably going to say, well, I understand. I, I'm probably going to give it, it's not. I'm going to give the nod to the, uh, to, sure. make, to bring in the money and giving people a, ple uh, a cheap place to shop. Sure. So with the enhanced designation and even with the designations today, it would really, for the most part, look only at that sort of core historic center, that core smart growth area. The enhanced designation, as far as what it looks at outside of there, it looks at the river corridor bylaws okay. and the flood hazard bylaws as opposed to looking at the planning and zoning in general. You know, there's an argument to be made that if we're going to incentivize the downtown, we should ask towns to be a little more thoughtful about strip development. Mm -hmm. That's something you could consider. Um, because, yeah. Did I answer your question? Close enough. All right. Yes. Thank Representative you. McCullough. Um, um, Kate, I, I fail to understand what your next to the last um, bullet point was. Mm -hmm. um, the last one, as I understood it, is we don't, we, we, we are not promoting enhanced designation town-wide. That's right. And the one prior to that was what? Um, that was about appeals. So I mentioned appeals, yeah. not promoting it town-wide, and then conditions on existing Act 250 permits. Okay, good. Before Thank that, you. I mentioned adequate protection for resources inside. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Kate? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have a few minutes before our next speaker is um, going to come to us. I haven't seen Sharon, um, but I guess I'm wondering if folks have ideas right now on areas we've covered so far in this conversation that they want more information on. For example, I'm thinking about um, reaching out to some of the jurisdictions that Bill Keaton mentioned yesterday, like hearing about the Puget Sound example or other places that are kind of already doing this. Other thoughts that you've had along the way so far about people you want to hear from? Yeah. Uh, so our, our current Act 250 um, has been effective in lots of ways, but not effective in, 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 in the master planning goal, if you will, as, as mentioned by John yesterday. Um, and today we've heard, um, I think, fairly consistently, yeah, it's the towns and, and, and the towns. And, and 
we, we do understand there's um, a, a great difference in the various towns um, abilities, capabilities, from staffing issues, which are always finance issues, which are even just population-based um, to, to support planning. And I want to better understand how we can, how the new Act 250 can be better at, at planning planning rather than just attaining goals through jurisdictional stuff. Um, again, back to the to the um, I got that by thousand paper cuts in my mind. John had it differently. Um, uh, Tragedy of the tyranny of, tyranny of the small decisions. And right now, each of our, and, and, and appropriately so, we should be looking at how each area is different, and that's some of the magic of Act 250, and yet that's driving the bus versus, versus um, maybe just saying, okay, towns, your, if your, your rules are gonna have to match our rules. <laughs> Um, like we do with uh, septic, for instance. You've got to be you, you, the state jurisdiction of in-ground septic. And, um, and that made a level playing field for everybody across the state. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to better understand how we might apply that concept um, in the new Act 250 to marrying, if you will, our, our independent town's requirements to the overall plan of that. So I think that's part of what's been called out is lining up the statutory requirements. And if you're going to get an enhanced designation or um, your town, if, you're, if your plan won't get approved unless it lines up with state. But I think it's Exploring that deeper is important. So yeah. As we hear from planners, Sharon Murray is a planner. She's part of the group that brought us those recommendations. So we may have time to ask her that today. Good. But if we don't get to it, we should make sure we do. Good. Yeah. I would like to hear more of how uh, <coughs> location jurisdiction applies to the working lands uh, in terms of uh, whether or not. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of getting an Act 250 permit, or whether or not conditions are applicable in, in the situation, depending on its location, or our projects. Or, you know, need to hear more testimony on that. Mm -hmm. it, at least help me. Yeah. We have a minute here to have a, a break and come back at 11 before you run off, Paul. Just we're going to have maybe longer floor time today um, than we expected when we made the agenda. So we'll see how long it goes. Hopefully, we'll have time to get to our witnesses. Um, but it could be that floor supersedes our work in committee and we'll have to reschedule with folks. So we'll just have to wait and see. But as soon as we are finished on the floor, we'll come back within you know, 10 minutes to try to honor our people we've invited to come and speak to us. Are we still doing a dinner tonight or not? That's a good question too. Um, here from Jerry. So sure. that must have been a rule. Hi, Jerry. I don't think I have my guess. Yeah, Jerry, don't worry. Hi, Jerry. How are you? With respect to the PUC decision. So Paul and Greg, excuse me, sorry, we, I just remember that Jerry had some comments he wanted to share with us, so I think we're going to pick up with the time we have to hear from him. Do you want to come back up here, or do you want to stay in? I'm going to go where I was going. Okay. <laughs> So I, I thought I, well, my name is Jerry Tarrant. Um, I live in Montpelier, um, and I've watched regulation 
throughout my life in Vermont. I've been involved at the state level and in practice. I'm a lawyer. I have a law firm, Tarrant Gillis and Richardson. Um, I'd like to speak as an individual, um, yes. not as a representative of anyone. Um, downtowns are special in Vermont. Um, I think we've started the conversation, which is a good thing, and we've probably gone beyond that because there's already statutory provisions for designated areas. But I think you've heard testimony today that there is an intent to fill in, and I think that's to fill in along river corridors and areas like that. And those are high resource areas, uh, enhanced resource areas in a lot of different ways. We've also been struggling for years in terms of water, purity, cleanliness, cleaning up the lakes, the streams and the rivers feed into our lakes. Our history shows clearly that we've built our commercial areas along rivers, especially in the downtown areas that now are becoming designated areas. And they're, especially in, in places like Montpelier, hydrocarbons and a lot of pollution along the rivers. And if you do not develop properly, those pollutions fall into the river. Can I ask, are you, as an attorney, are you representing anyone or representing yourself? Am I representing anyone? Um, I mean, are you here representing yourself or just myself? Yeah, I have, I have yeah. no fight yeah. Yeah. No in this in yeah. terms of okay. clients or anything. Um, I own, th own three buildings in Montpelier that are in the flood zone along the river, along the North Branch, that feed into the Winooski. I deal with flood insurance and the problems with flooding. They're not minor to the extent there have been indications that it's a little bit of a cleanup. If you've lived through the floods in different parts of the state, you know it's not a little bit of a cleanup. Before you put public monies into floodways, flood corridors, flood areas, and spend public monies, understand that there are also costs. You may save 5 or 10 or 15 percent on the appeals, perhaps, but there are costs that are ongoing monetary costs. But there's more than that. Act 250 is not just about aesthetics and beautifying and protecting ag soils. The guts of Act 250 are about safety and health and welfare in a narrow and a broader sense. If you look at the existing Act 250 under Criterion 1, it talks about <coughs> floodways, streams, and shorelines. And in each instance, the legislature talked about a permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that in addition to all other criteria, the development or subdivision of lands within a floodway will not restrict or divert the flow of floodwaters and endanger the health, safety, and welfare of the public or of riparian owners during the flooding. Streams, same language, go through it. And it goes down and maintain the natural condition of the stream and will not endanger the health, safety, welfare of the public. <clears throat> Shorelines, same thing. And it goes insofar as public health and safety. Same thing under traffic. The guts of Act 250 are about your children and grandchildren <coughs> and my children and grandchildren being safe. And what you heard this morning is we'd like to put this development in downtowns and we'd like less regulation. And I guess I'm here to say there's more than just applying Act 250 or taking it away. If you want, one, in, one example would be have a smaller Act 250 that applies to enhanced areas, that deals with safety and welfare. Welfare and safety not only for me and my children and grandchildren and yours, but also to help clean up the waterways We've seen, and we will see again, big flooding. 
I have a friend downtown on State Street has 14 pumps in his basement. He spent, he's a commercial enterprise. He spent tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands to do that. No one else that I know in Montpelier has that. I have one pump in one building. It's a great first step to try to protect those historic buildings that can be renovated or are lived in already. I've renovated mine and we have apartments. And it's a good thing because I, th I think downtowns are a special part of Vermont. And I think protecting them, <coughs> not only them, but the people is worthy. To simply say, and we've been through this with your commission, every state agency came in. And I know the people in these state agencies, they love regulation. V-trains, forests and parks, agency of commerce, don't regulate us. Nobody wants to be regulated. If there's not a problem, when you go through Act 250, and I've done it many, many, many times, do you have a problem, any issues on this? You just cross it off. And you get down, even at the district commission level, to traffic, consistency with the town plan, and if it's on a stream, you can look at the stream and the floodways. That's it. It's not just on the appeal. You, when, when someone comes up and says there aren't any sheep downtown and there's not a prime ag soil and there's not, um, uh, for the most part, natural areas, and probably so. In Montpelier, we have hundreds and hundreds of acres that are undeveloped. They need to be developed right, I think. And in the downtown areas, I think you can find a way where you protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, allow for development, renovations, and do it the right way, rather than just exempt state agencies. I think that's the, the biggest point I'd like to make, because I found a lot of generalizations being made this morning. You know, there aren't any Act 250 criteria that have to apply, and it's just a, a, we're worried about the appeals and stuff. No one that I know is going to spend thousands of dollars on an appeal if there aren't really issues. The people that live in downtowns, the issues are health and safety and welfare of their children, traffic, and floodways. Flooding's a big issue now, as you know. And it's not just in some pockets down in the southern part of the state where towns have been really hit hard. Montpelier's been hit hard by flooding in the last 30 years. Um, and and it's, it's an issue that's it's hard to deal with. The other thing I want to say is when you get into this, and I think most of the comments show that you understand this, towns have different zoning regulations. If they have zoning, it's not, they're not all the same. You look at Title 24, the legislature has said you have to adopt a certain few criteria, like traffic and small lots and something like that. But they, all the zoning throughout the state, they're different, and they're applied differently and they have different resources in terms of people to implement them. And so not all towns and cities are regulated the same way. The purpose back 50 years ago from, for Act 250 was to have consistency on a statewide level so that on large development, and here this is an issue for debate jurisdictionally, is it just size or is it importance that should be regulated. And here's an example with your designated areas downtown. It may not be 10 acres. It may only be three acres. But it should be regulated if it's on in a floodway. And it's in a high traffic zone. And the town is inclined just to get taxes up and not look hard at the traffic or the, the flood issues. Active 50 is charged with doing that, and that's why some people don't like Active 50 because they actually look at it. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, and I guess that's my point. Any questions, Jerry? Uh, one other question, uh, and I appreciate you mentioning the health and welfare issues that are around criterion 1D, and, and that also helps us ensure compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. Right. But my my question to you is about if we were to think about a Act 250 light per se, 
and, and in recognition that we're trying to um, reduce the cost of our energy costs, whether it's weatherization or electricity, for all new development, commercial um, or residential. Would, what would you, um, what's your thinking in, along lines of trying to improve the efficiency of our buildings or new buildings or renovated buildings in uh, specific to Criterion 9? Um, Which efficiency is on more important than almost anything. Um, certainly much more important than renewable energy. I mean, I think renewable energy comes after efficiency. Efficiency should be the number one issue. It's expensive for efficiency. And, and if there are ways to help people become more efficient and public buildings become more efficient, and certainly any subsidized area where public monies are going into subsidized housing, that they should be energy efficient right to the hill. Energy efficiency is the key. If, I mean, number one. Well, it saves the state money in terms of avoided cost of new energy source, development of new energy sources if we can manage through efficiency, uh, you know, our demand for energy. So. Yeah, I, I, I think we've been struggling with this for as long as I've been, I was involved in the utility regulation for a number of years and it's always been a difficult thing because when you deal with humanity, uh, not everybody has the same amount of money, first of all, or the same standards or the same desires and developers are the same way and so it's hard unless you regulate in a way and the key of course is to regulate development where public funds are going in and where there is review like Act 250 and make sure that they meet high levels of efficiency. Otherwise um, it's a waste of money um, and it does make sense to have more development in towns but you got to do it the right way, um, especially because our s towns and villages and even small cities like Montpelier are are fragile. I mean, we're struggling right now. They're putting in a hotel, a transit center, and a 450 parking garage in, in a flood area. It's it's not appeal, but um, because it's it's hard to. But cities want to do that. Towns want to do that because they want the tax money. And they're not always thinking about the other residual effects because let the state worry about that or let somebody else worry about it. Representative um, McCullough. One, one of the last points that you made, I want to be sure I understand. Um, should Act 250 be just about the size of the project? Um, and then, or should it be, and I'm going to substitute, because I don't think you used the word locational specific, but we heard that idea, or should it be, if it's not just about the size, should it be about the, the resource? Is that what you were um, getting at? Yeah, I think this is, this is difficult. It was easy back 50 years ago to simply say size yeah. matters. Yeah. I mean... Um, because it was a lot of it was ski resort and second house, second homes from out of staters, and th those were the, the driving forces for the regulation. Um, I, I do think Act 250 needs to be looked at, and and it's not just size anymore. It's um, like enhanced designations, maybe an acre and a half, but it might right be on a, on a river bank, and it might you know it might cause also, and it might have endangered species, or it might. Um, so I think it has to be more than just size. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, and and, and um, the, the other thing you mentioned uh, for you and, 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 well, indeed for what it is, Act 250, um, safety, health, welfare of, of people. And, and we, we, um, we understand that um, all of the above, also is about the economy and the, the, the uh, it was posited yesterday Act 250 is really an economic bill. Would you agree with you weren't here for that testimony? No I wasn't but I, I don't disagree with that if you plan properly and planning is really difficult and I've heard people for the last year and a half before uh, your chair's commission talk about we plan right we plan well you know not necessarily. Uh, I've seen really poor planning in this state, and I've seen cities 
like Montpelier, that didn't even follow the statutes. Mm -hmm. And they had to start over again because they didn't follow the statutes. They didn't do fundamental planning. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and finally, if I could, um, you were in the room earlier this morning when, when I talked about perhaps Act 250 needs to move toward, um, like we did with uh, subsurface disposal, statewide jurisdiction for subsurface um, disposal. Act 250 may want to also move forward with a statewide jurisdictional um, component. And so we no longer have to depend on the various towns trying to come up with their own their own thing. It, they can do that as long as it meets um, master plan goals in Act 250. Where, where are you on that thought? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're headed towards um, what I like to say about when I acknowledge my weaknesses, I like to say that I'm evolving and trying to improve. <laughs> I think the same thing is, is true for our towns and villages and state. We have to evolve and we have to get better and we are going to get better. I mean, we're at the beginning, essentially, of time. It passed this prologue and we have to, we can improve. And, and everything that, that, that Amy Sheldon's commission looked at can be approved and proved upon, I think. Um, and, and I'm, not in, I'm not in favor of big bureaucracies and I, I just think you can do it better. And um, one way is not to waive jurisdiction in designated areas downtown. Um, but there are other ways. And, and economics play a big part in terms of transportation and things like that. And efficiency for energy. We, we are really at the beginning of a lot of these enterprises and industries. We haven't really gone as far as we could go. Thank you. And a lot of it's planning. Yeah. I, I, this is going to take a while to get this right, and I think you're you got good conversations going. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're ready to hear from Sharon Murray. set up. I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation if we can get it to work. Um, it's on our web page also, so folks yeah. can ref hit refresh and Sharon's presentation will show up. Uh, my name is Sharon Murray. I'm here on behalf of the Vermont Planners Association. Um, I've been a professional planner working in Vermont for the last 30 years, I hate to say. Uh, 10 years up at the Northwest Regional Planning Commission in St. Albans and the last 20 or so years, I won't say exactly how many, uh, working for uh, local, regional, and state government, basically, as a planning consultant. So, and I was formerly the, the legislative liaison for the Vermont Planners Association, but I'm here today because I was appointed as our advisor to the Act 250 Commission. Uh, VPA took a real interest in, in this process. Yeah, oh good, thank you. Um, we had an active working group headed by Peg Elmer, who I think some of you are also know. And uh, I've been also working closely as follow-up with Alex Weinhagen, our legislative liaison, who I think you met last week. He was in committee. Um, so I was asked today to talk about Maryland's growth tier system. Uh, and it's a bit of a nerdy topic, and I'm the nerd of the group, so I was the one elected to come and sit here. And I want to apologize in advance for uh, some of the slides are a bit wordy. They started out as handouts, and then I didn't have time, so I just <laughs> threw everything in here. But basically what I'm hoping today is to walk you through the process that Maryland went through um, in defining what they call growth tiers and how they use that in regulation. Um, 
in terms of our, our work in this area, some of you may be aware that back last May 2018, BPA with a whole lot of other groups uh, sponsored an Act 250 conference at the law school. Um, and that was funded in part by High Meadows. And again, uh, BNRC, the law school, BAPTA, uh, you know, a lot of, most of the planning groups in the state. And the intent of this was to support the work of the Act 250 Commission by providing a forum for basically a deep dive into Act 250 um, it, to accompany everything the Commission was doing in terms of getting public input. So we had over 200 attendees at this conference, most of whom were familiar with Act 250. Um, so we were trying to generate a lot of good ideas for you to consider as you go forward. One of the panels we had that day was on outside perspectives. We invited three people working in other states who also had experience and connections with Vermont. Um, and that included Josh uh, Brower from Washington State. He was actually the chair of the Seattle Planning Commission. Uh, Drew Schmidt Perkins, who worked down in Maryland, and Rob Sanford, who some of you may know, who was uh, currently a professor at uh, University of Southern Maine, but was a former Act 250 uh, coordinator. So all these people had some knowledge and experience of Act 250, but we were saying, okay, how does it compare to what you do where you are now? Um, Drew uh, is provided the Maryland example. Drew worked with a thousand friends of Maryland. They're really interested in land use and water quality and how those two things connect. Um, so she's also now on the board of Smart Growth America, but at the time they were really advocating for Maryland to do better on how they regulate subdivision and development in relation to water quality. So they really advocated for a law that Maryland passed back in 2012 that we'll be going over briefly today. And basically what this law does is set up for Maryland's really into tiers. I'm not sure I'm fond of that, but they call everything tiers. Uh, but they set up four tiers that are very location-based jurisdiction for water quality. And basically they do that by regulating septic systems. So it's also called the septic law. Uh, this law was passed by Bar Maryland back in 2012. It's taken some time to implement. You know, we're in six years later, so there's some interesting results that I'll, I'll present briefly. Um, the law only applies to residential subdivisions. It doesn't, like, unlike Act 250, it doesn't apply to commercial development. Um, and it's, yeah, and you probably know that Maryland's a little different than Vermont, that they regulate land use, zoning, and planning at the county level and at the incorporated municipal level. So urban areas like Baltimore and, and well, smaller areas too that are incorporated also do uh, zoning and planning, but a lot of it's done at the county level in Maryland, which for your purposes is interesting because it is somewhat similar to a district commission regional review at that level. One of the things I found interesting, most interesting, was the intent of this legislation should sound very familiar to all of us. One, it was to look at subdivision, what was happening in Maryland in relation to water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, um, and they were very interested in uh, more stringently regulating their septic systems, more for nitrogen and phosphorus in that context. But the impacts of sprawl and development on water quality. And the second was the impacts of sprawl and development on forest and farmland, big blocks of forest and farmland. So it's very much, uh, they had some of the similar discussions that we've been having in terms of changes, to possible changes to Act 250. Chair, before you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. what is the last bullet, voluntary but required? Oh, sorry, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Basically, what this law does, it's set up a whole mapping and regulatory scheme <coughs> that's adopted at the local level, local being county and, and some municipalities. Um, you don't have to adopt it, but the effect of that is if you don't adopt uh, these map, this mapping process and, and uh, regulations tied to it, then you can't 
allow for major subdivisions outside of areas that are already served by water and sewer. So it becomes very restrictive if you don't do this. And I will say, in general, this law tends to be more restrictive than what we do in Vermont. And I'm not sure BPA would recommend that, but we can talk about it a little bit more as we go on. More restricted in what way? Uh, in terms of allowing development. In, uh, in terms of Act 250, we generally allow it with conditions. In the Maryland uh, role, they actually, you're allowed a certain amount of subdivision and then no more. So it, it, it essentially sets a cap, especially in rural areas, on how much subdivision can occur, um, which we don't do right now. So again, it sets up what they call tiers. They're basically four different areas that are re they, they require counties and local areas to map. Um, <coughs> tier one is the area that's currently served by water and sewer. So those areas are pretty easily defined by existing water and sewer areas. Tier two are areas that have been planned for growth, that basically have been planned for areas that where water and sewers plan to occur, so expanded water and sewer areas. Um, that's something we don't really have in Vermont in terms of Act 250 at least. We don't have that kind of uh, designation. Tier three is basically what I would say most of Vermont falls in. It's the rural areas served by on-site systems. Again, there's no public water and sewer. It's just on-site areas. And then tier four is something they had a lot of discussion about uh, as they were going through this process. It's rural areas that right now may be served by on-site septic systems, but also include a lot of areas of critical value. So tier four is basically what I would call their conservation lands. They include large blocks of ag and uh, farm and forest land and also other resource lands that are considered significant. Um, so that's the general scheme of things. Those are the areas that communities, the counties and communities were requ required under this law to map if they wanted to participate. The law also defined residential subdivisions, and actually I was surprised because this is very similar to what we do in Vermont in terms of how we define these things. So a minor subdivision uh, can't exceed, under the law, seven new lots, plats, or building sites. The default, if you decide not to go through this process, they define minor as less than five lots. That's very consistent with how a lot of Vermont communities define minor subdivisions who regulate subdivision. It's also somewhat consistent with Act 250 in terms of our one acre, 10 acre town. I don't know if you've gotten into that yet, but um, as you know, if, you're, uh, if you don't have zoning and subdivision regulations, the threshold for review is six lots versus 10 lots. So again, it falls within that range of minor subdivision. Major subdivisions then are anything that are bigger than that. So anything that's you know more than five lots by default. Uh, and again, that's what's limited under the new the new rules, the the ability to regulate major or allow for and regulate major subdivisions. In tier four, those and I should have put this on another slide, but in those conservation areas, basically the bottom line is no new big subdivisions. So any subdivision in there would be typically five lots or less. And again, that's to minimize fragmentation of those resources. There is an exception in the law. If you have zoning or subdivision regulations within those areas that allow for a density of only one unit per 20 acres, then they will give you an exception and allow for major subdivisions. But that means that, you know, again, if you have 100 acres, you're allowed five, five building sites. And there are other restrictions around that that they need to be clustered so that they can't fragment. Um, <coughs> generally, those areas are not supposed to go through anything but minor subdivision. Representative Smith has yeah, a question. Just, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, and we're talking about uh, conserving or preserving uh, uh, ag land, open land mm -hmm. space. It seems all breaking up 100 acres into five lots in order to circumvent the system. 
is kind of counterproductive. It is, and that's why in this, you know, we'll get, get into it a little more, probably in too much detail, if you, and let me know if it is, but uh, you're right. So where that is allowed, again, it, it can, that's the, the density that's allowed. It has to be clustered, too. There's other things that okay, go along so with that. Okay, so they would cut clusters on maybe a 20-acre parcel. Or even corner. less. Even less? Yeah. Okay, and then the and rest then the of rest it. And the rest of it would still remain open, okay. which is actually an approach a lot of communities in Vermont take now. Um, in terms terms of, of right? So then it becomes common land. Common land, or else it's yeah. maintained as a separate parcel that's lent it or leased out or sold to a, you know, a log or a farmer or forester. There's different ownership options for that, but yeah, it's maintained as a single unit. Um, and again, that's what the other critical part of this bill was how they define farm and forest land um, for map, at least for mapping purposes. So again, this is all done at the county level with some guidance from the state. These areas were mapped initially to include any areas that were planned or zoned for resource conservation. Um, areas, they have other designations, which is something we might consider in Vermont at some point. You, I know you've been hearing about our uh, village and downtown designations. Maryland also has rural legacy and ag area designations. So areas that have already received those designations are automatically included in, the, in these areas. Uh, I think of interest to you might be the isolated areas of, that are 100 acres or more. And this is initially defined by land cover. So if you look on a satellite photo or land cover map and you see there's 100 contiguous acres of farm and forest land, initially you're supposed to include that in your tier four area too. We've been talking about how to define things like forest blocks. Um, and that, so again, they went through a similar process. Um, so this is the initial mapping. Then after those areas are initially mapped, there's a, a second step going back through all those maps to make sure they make sense. And we'll see what the difference is between that initial mapping and how they finally come out. Representative McCullough has a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the 100 acres or more <coughs> contiguous combined farm forest and mm -hmm. other natural, um, do those need to be, those acres need to be under um, single ownership or are they just contiguous parcels? Um, Farmer Brown has 25 and and the other guy has seven. Yep, again, this was done through land cover, so yep. it's just looking at a picture yep. and saying, yep. yep, there's farm field here, there's woodland here. And again, that was the initial cut, uh, but there was some second, uh, you know, another level of review of that to th look at things like ownership patterns and, and stuff. So it's, it was basically a two-step process to define those areas. And it's all done at the county level, this mapping? Um, yeah, for, for this, yes, because, and here, I'll, I'll push up. This is the one that I didn't want to spend too much, but this is kind of sums up everything that's in each tier. Um, and the first two tiers are largely at the municipal level. Again, they're the places where there's the tier ones where there's water and sewer, existing water and sewer service. So those are areas that have already received a lot of public investment. They're the areas that have the infrastructure to support higher density development. So they're very much similar to what we've been talking about in terms of enhanced designation areas. Some of them, not all of them, but um, again, they tie it to water and sewer. In Vermont, we haven't done that quite yet. Uh, so they include, again, water, basically they're water and sewer service areas. Um, tier two are the areas that the, either the county or the local community has planned for water and sewer expansion. So they're areas that will be served with uh, public infrastructure within, say, the next 10 years. You know, and there's a whole process that Maryland has in place for, for having counties and communities define those areas. Again, those are the areas that are supposed there to support new development at the same density that's happening in areas that are already built out or have water and sewer because they're supporting infrastructure for that. Uh, so that's kind of like the core and then the donut around the core. 
where the expansion is going to occur. Uh, tier three, again, that's very similar to most of Vermont rural areas served by on-site systems. Um, in terms of designations, actually a lot of our village designations, because they don't have water and sewer, uh, would be included in tier three, and that's very similar in Maryland. They have rural villages also that are not served by water and sewer, so they're in tier three. Um, and th those are areas that have been identified locally within rural areas for growth. Um, uh, but again, supported by on-site systems, shared community on-site systems, not public infrastructure. Uh, I will say that in early days of Act 250, and we can talk about this a little, those areas were called rural growth areas, and there used to be a criteria specific to them under Criterion 9. Uh, which we amended a while ago to deal more with existing settlements and our, our designated areas. But originally Act 250 was mapped and designed to deal with rural growth areas, which is basically that Tier 3 stuff. And then Tier 4, again, are the conservation areas. So if you go through in terms of what that means, in Tier 1, Minor subdivisions and major subdivisions are allowed because they have the ability to hook into infrastructure. So there's no real review. It's the least restrictive in terms of this law. Um, a, local communities can still regulate that stuff, but it's done locally. It's just assumed that they have the capacity to support new development. So again, that's kind of what you're talking about with enhanced designations, areas that have been clearly shown to be able to support development. Um, again, Vermont, we don't have Tier 2, but under Tier 2, you, you can allow for larger subdivisions, but only if they're actually hooked onto sewer. Uh, you can allow for minor subdivisions, smaller subdivisions on an interim basis, um, if they're supported by on-site systems, with the assumption that at some point they're going to get hooked into a public water, water sewer system. And again, the intent is that those areas have to be developed at the same or greater density than the current areas designated for development. Um, tier three, you, just a quick yeah. question. Um, <clears throat> so for, for smaller communities today mm -hmm. that are using more decentralized wastewater, which mm -hmm. are somewhat of an indirect system, right. a larger um, leach field based on-site system, mm -hmm. would that fall under your tier three tier three okay. yeah anything that's soil based would be under tier three why well, I, I shouldn't say that. anything that's not a public sewer system is under tier three so that includes individual on-site um, shared on-site and community on similar to yeah, community systems um, and then tier four, and, and I will say too, in Maryland, they actually allow for and plan for large, large lot rural development, which we try to avoid in Vermont. But again, tier three doesn't include those conservation areas that are they view as critical. So if you're out of a conservation area and you want a 20 acre parcel, well, you know, it's okay on on site in those. But the one thing about tier three is that, again, you can have a minor subdivision, uh, say five or seven lots, then there's no more subdivision of that land, no more subdivision of the retained parcel or the lots. So it's basically fixed in time at the point, and that's something that we don't do in Vermont. Um, and you can but also- some towns do. Uh, they do, you can put limits on subdivision, <coughs> especially if you have conserved open space attached to it. Well, um, we're in like the case of the clustering. Yeah, yeah. Like I we know do Middlebury's that. rural ag area, it's basically 10 acre zoning clustered and capped. Right. But it, yeah, often that applies to the, the <coughs> it's not necessarily the retained parcel, too. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. There are there are limits in some, some areas. Um, So, and then you can allow major subdivisions, you know, anything over five acres are allowed there on, on, but they require full review, not just on water and sewer, but environmental impacts and subjects. So it becomes more similar to what you do now under Act 250. It's not just a septic review at that point. It's if you're in tier three and you're more than five lots, then you go through a full review. 
which is very similar to what we do today. So I would say in terms of parallels, much of what we do falls under Act two, three, or Tier 3. And Tier 4 is the one that we're all talking about within committee and out of committee. Uh, how do we define that? You know, how do we regulate it? Um, and again, in Maryland, uh, you're allowed to do minor subdivisions, but again, no further subdivision. Once you do your five lots, that's it. Um, you're not allowed to do major subdivisions unless you've gone through that exception process by defining regulations, again, that only allow one unit for 20 acres or even less than that. Uh, but there is an exception there for some of the towns that do pretty uh, restrictive subdivision and zoning. So, and again, I've already talked about this a bit, but the, the big difference is the, the limits on re-subdivisions of land. Uh, and this applies, again, to things that are on on-site <coughs> systems, not to subdivisions on served by water and sewer. So the process for doing all this, you know, the state defines those definitions we talked about. It defines some of the parameters, and it defines even some guidance in their statute, and I'm happy to forward a copy of the statutes themselves if, if you're interested or legislative council's interested. Um, but a lot of the guidance can't, comes from the state level. Uh, the, they have a, the Maryland Planning Department uh, was responsible for rolling out this program with communities and providing the guidance needed to actually implement it. Uh, but again, the mapping itself was done at the county and the local level. So, and at the local level, it's mainly dealing with those tier one, tier two, you know, the areas that were served by water and sewer and the areas that are planned for water and sewer. Most of those within, in Maryland are within incorporated municipalities. Uh, and then the, the three and four very much were done at the county level, at the regional level, in terms of defining rural areas and these these conservation areas. Sure, mm -hmm. uh, you say most of the mapping is done at the local and regional levels, and mm -hmm. uh, is that reviewed by the state or? Does yep. that, and does That's the state, what can they know? Can they nullify? Can I say no? That doesn't work. Well, it, it's interesting. The, yes, it, the guidance comes top down from the state and says these are the parameters. Here's all the information you need. But it's done at the local level. The counties and the municipalities then send their their maps to the state for review. Mm -hmm. The planning department gets to comment on them, and if state planning the state planning department and if. There are sufficient comments at that point. They, they don't deny it, but they say you have to have a public hearing on it. It's really interesting that this all this process can happen without any public input, which is not something I necessarily support either. But, but um, at that point, if, if the state has serious concerns about it, then they say you go have a public hearing on this. Um, but at that point, it's still up to the locality to adopt it. The decision, the final decision, rests with the lo locality? Yes. Again, it's technically a voluntary program. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, and you adopt your maps, then they're recognized locally. I know mm -hmm. that you know, as it's rolled out, there have been some issues with that. Mm -hmm. um, with a couple of counties that the, the disparities are so great that there's concern that they're they're not meeting mm -hmm. the intent of the law and therefore mm -hmm. there needs to be some ability to enforce this <laughs> but for now it is adopted locally and then it's just recognized at the state level where there is a dispute you know say between a municipality and county or local and regional level right. um, the planning department does mediate that, and if they can't resolve it, it becomes a decision of the Department of Environment there, because again, it's tied to their septic regulations. So Is it ever appealed to court? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but again, I, I, okay. I don't know. Okay. Representative McCullough. Um, earlier, I, I thought I heard you say that um, 
it, it is voluntary mm -hmm. by the towns slash counties, but that if they did not meet the tier standards, um, then then they were this they were subject to statewide regulations that were more stringent. Did I hear that correctly? No, no. I mean, the state will still regulate septic systems too. That those are regulated separately. What what it means is you can't approve any major subdivisions. Mm -hmm. So if if you decide not to participate in this program at the county level, mm -hmm. the only subdivisions you can approve are <laughs> five lots or less mm -hmm. or less than five lots. Okay. So it basically limits your ability to allow for development. Right. right. Okay. That, that that that's that's a finer point. I'm glad I Check back. Yeah, thank the, you. the other thing is, of course, you're aware we have conservation design mapping, mm -hmm. and and um, that is a statewide plan already, map already. Right. What's the? It, and and but the Maryland plan is flipped, well, so I'm wondering about actually. It's, it's flipped to a point, you know, and, and we'll go with Maryland did again. They provided the statutes, the parameters and guidance. Yep. Part of that guidance was something very similar to what we have, a web based mapping platform. OK, so they had similar maps again, based more on land cover. Our forest blocks are defined, you know, in other ways, too. Mm -hmm but they did have a map, all these map data layers, and you could default to those. You could just go on to the state's platform, pull up those those data layers and adopt them as your map. Right. Um, so, so, yeah. so they had done some mapping too, okay. in support of this process. Good. So can you, so, just, mm -hmm. I just wanna hear that one thought again, because it's sure. really important. Yeah. You could use their mapping, you could default to their mapping. Right. And, I, and it's my understanding too that some municipalities defaulted to the county or the regional level maps too. Right. You know, and again, this is very similar to what we set up for enhanced energy planning uh, for plans and, and things that go through uh, the public service board. Or I'm sorry, I'm still back in the old days, the uh, Public Utilities Commission. So we have enhanced energy planning where we have regions and towns do this kind of mapping. And then it gives them more weight in the the 248 right. process. Yeah. So, so Sharon, mm -hmm. the, the 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 thought that the chair um, discovered um, from you is that the towns could by could accept those maps by default, mm -hmm. or just say we're we're accepting them, and so so. I'm taking that one additional step. We have all of these maps now with the, the multiple layers, um, and we could, um, I, I, I'm going to pause it, we could, they are totally available to the towns, the towns adopt those maps or not, and if they don't, then it goes back to, okay, you didn't adopt it. You wanted to change it this way and that way, and then there's then there's some back and forth, um, which is kind of backwards from the way it's done in Maryland. Um, and and how does that that idea sound? Well, I know like within again enhanced energy planning, those maps are prepared and then they're reviewed and approved mm -hmm. at the regional level. Okay. Um, along with the municipal plan okay. approval. Yeah. So okay. it could be a that process could. that's similar to that. Yep. There's also, again, the option for, in that process, I think, for communities to accept the regional plan yes. as their plan. So again, it, it could be a very similar process to that. Thank you. But this is what I thought was kind of interesting, and as a planner especially, uh, University of Maryland, again, this has been on the books now for six years. Most of the counties have filed their maps and are in effect. But what this shows is what came out of the state's database using their data layers. And again, the big difference in here is tier three and tier four. So tier three is again the rural areas where development's allowed on, on site. Mm -hmm. Tier four is where you don't want to limit you want to limit development and not allow it. So when you use the state maps mapping platform, this is what you came up with. And again, this was based largely on land cover. 
So the Tier 4 area, the green, is much more extensive for Frederick County uh, based just on land cover information. When the county actually went through and processed that information, um, usually, again, you know, the first step is this initial cover, and then you go back and say, okay, what are the ownership patterns, what's happening on the ground there, you know, we're going to have more input. This is what they came up with, and I expect something very similar would happen in Vermont, mm -hmm. um, that most of this green turned yellow, <laughs> and that's the Tier 3 area where development is allowed. Again, very limited development, minor subdivisions, major subdivisions with full review, similar to our full Act 250 review now. Um, but it does show that the, in terms of the mapping, there is a difference as it goes through that process. It also shows a lot more Tier 2 on the state's map, which is interesting. So yeah. it shows more proposed mm -hmm. in a core uh -huh. and much less outlining Outlining it. Hmm. Right, and I think these are because this is again much more detailed into where these areas are actually planning to extend their water and sewer systems. So that we don't, and we don't know the level of accuracy or filter that the state used to create their map. Well, again, my understanding is that the the initial were those elements that I listed: the hundred acre land <coughs> cover, the existing. Uh, right, but the units that that's done that matters, right? So how coarse the scale is. How coarse, are. yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's some very similar to what we use in Vermont, or at least for the land cover data. Um, so that, that factors into this, too. Representative Dolan. Um, <clears throat> my, um, I guess my reaction to this mm -hmm. is that at uh, the statewide level, they're viewing certain land uses as a tier four land use where you're trying to preserve the land at agricultural and working forest, landscape yeah. kind of values. But when you bring that kind of planning down to a regional level here in the, the in this case Maryland with county government, they uh, it, from my reaction, maybe you could correct that, mm -hmm. the reaction is there's less interest in a working landscape and more a, um, a, a, um, a almost an easing of um, any kind of restrictions on that and on that front in order to allow for more land to qualify under a, a <laughs> tier three development pattern. Well, one thing I'm, I don't know is what the current regulations are. Right. What, what this does say, that, and you're right, it definitely shifts a lot of land out of Tier 4 into Tier 3, which would essentially say, yeah, it's okay to develop here. But again, in Maryland's case, that development means you've got to go through a full review. Again, similar to what we do under Act 250, um, you can't just approve a subdivision plat. You've got to look at all the environmental impacts of those areas. So it may have actually, and again, there's also in Tier 3 still limits on further subdivision, so, which we don't have. So it still does restrict the spread of residential development in those areas, but you're right. It's definitely a different... Um, Scheme and I and again, it's partly you're right. I'm sure partly it's political, yeah. but it's also again reflects a more detailed look at those areas than you have at the state level. And for the county I, is a booming. Yeah. And it, is it their is it their growth biggest area? It's one of Montgomery them. County. Montgomery is and, yeah, and that I I was kind of hoping they'd have Montgomery County, but yeah. yeah. But so I it's an in between kind of county. Yeah. Okay. And actually, I don't know, Brian's from down there. You might <laughs> have a better sense. This is within the D.C. community. Yeah, commuter right. shed, yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, the development pressures are uh, down there are much greater than they are here, too. Mm -hmm. I have one question on mm -hmm. that. And the difference between the two, uh, the regional folks, wouldn't they be more interested in economic development? Um, 
Again, it's always a balancing act. Mm -hmm. it, it really, in, again, that partly reflects local and regional planning and zoning in, in areas that are underserved. They probably do want more development. In areas that are experiencing too much growth and development, mm -hmm. they probably appreciate the fact that they can limit it more. Um, so it's always a balancing act, and that's really the, it, part of the difference, I think, between those two maps is, you know, what are the local goals and objectives for growth and development and for land conservation. So again, some quick comparisons. Maryland's is based, in terms of their location base, is all on water and sewer. You know, in Vermont, we look more at whether towns have adopted zoning subdivision regulations. Um, so one's infrastructure based, the other's more policy based. Um, Maryland has designated areas just like we do, but they do it both for um, where they want development to occur. Again, what we're talking about in terms of enhanced designations for downtowns and villages. But they also have designations for their rural areas that we don't have. Um, the other thing, Maryland is requiring mapping, and that's one thing that we've been missing for a long time in terms of location-based uh, jurisdictions. Uh, again, and, and when Act 250 was originally adopted, there were maps attached to it. Uh, there were county level maps, capability and development maps that we we have recommended to you to consider bringing back. Um, that would include both mapping critical areas like forest land, as well as areas that are designated for development, like our existing and planned settlements. Um, in terms of the jurisdiction, it's actually somewhat similar. Again, at Maryland, most of this is happening at the county level, so it's very similar to happening at the Act 250 level. I will say that Act 250 is a more comprehensive review. Maryland's just getting into that now. Although, again, some of their counties have pretty extensive subdivision and zoning regulations. So. Um, and again, there, there are more limitations on subdivision than we have in statute anyway, uh, and for Act 250, than what exists in Vermont. And so just some takeaways in terms of location-based jurisdiction. The intents are very, same, very similar to what they did in terms of what we're trying to do. Tier 1's where they want to promote development, Tier 1 and 2. So in a sense, that's parallel to our designations and our existing settlements. Um, tier 3 is where you allow subdivision and development, but with a higher level of review. Again, we sort of do that now, but that could be even clarified more. And then the difference would be Tier 4, where we're talking about even more restrictive jurisdiction or limits on development which we haven't quite gotten to yet, but we're talking about. And so, and that could either be through jurisdiction, whether Act 250 applies or not, or it could be if Act 250 applies, these are the things we need to take into consideration. So there's, there's options there too. Um, the guidance is basically top down, but uh, and we would encourage you to consider this, that the mapping and implementation should still be bottom up, especially if you want local communities and regions to buy into the process. So we would support something like is what's being done for enhanced energy planning, to have that mapping occur with some state guidance at the municipal and, and regional level. Um, and then have some kind of sign off, as you mentioned, at the state level to make sure it's meeting the state's criteria. Can you explain how if, um, the capability and development plan maps then would interact if you think mapping should come from the bottom up, but we have capability and development plan maps? Where do they meet and how do they, in your yeah. mind, when you recommend both those things, how does that look? Um, yeah, I think the capability to development plan maps could be these maps that Maryland's, you know, a version of this and maybe different things. And if so, again, it, it would be the state guidance that this is what we want to see on those maps. Um, and then that would be up to the local and regional folks to define those. 
So they would be doing the capability development plan mapping. That's an option, yeah. I mean, at least there should be some level of local and regional review of those maps. And I think that was even the intent in Act 250, that there was a public review process for those maps. Um, but, you know, and again, I, I think it, it, being planners, we really recognize and would emphasize the importance of having maps to be able to, to, especially in Act 250 under Criteria 9, which where those old maps were applied. So things like existing settlements, rural growth areas, it's really hard to interpret that if you're just looking at words on a page. It's much easier to see where that is if you have a map in front of you. Um, so we would ask that you bring those back into the process somehow. Um, and there are different options for that. Representative Smith. Yeah, uh, don't we have a combination of local and state mapping overlays in our process today? Well, we've got regional and municipal plans, and those maps we hope are considered under there's a separate criterion 10 conformance with the local and regional plan. Uh, in the past, those maps have not always been reviewed. <laughs> Uh, it's gotten more down to what's the policy say in the plan versus what does the map show you? By oh, the district commission. Yeah. Um, and then, it, but in terms of criteria nine, if you look at the language, it says that a project has to conform to the capability and development plan, which in effect no longer exists, but could again. Um, and that's what we're asking you to reconsider bringing back so that those criteria under nine can be have a spatial context. So could our regional planning maps then just be kind of lined up then with that? So they could still come from our regional commissions but you'd have them um, defining those areas? So. Well again that's what they did in in um, Maryland, and you saw the result. I, but I do think that, you know, again, the guidance should come from the state. So we have suggested that the state I, uh, map critical state interests for consideration at the local and regional level. So if, it, you know, and there, uh, I will admit there's some concern over the forest blocks, how they're currently mapped. In my town, Bolton, the entire town is within a, in a forest block. Um, so if that actually triggered Act 250 jurisdiction for any development, that means anything in Bolton's going to have to go through Act 250 review. Uh, if it triggered, if it's an Act 250 project in Bolton, then you've got to deal with forest resources. I think that's a different discussion. So partly it's what are you going to use those maps for? But certainly, in order for us to be all on the same page, it would be very helpful for the state to map, to map what you consider what the state considers are critical resources. And that could be existing settlements, water and sewer areas, you know, forest blocks, um, interchange areas I think are identified on the list. Uh, and again, at least as an initial cut for the state to do it and then have that reviewed at the local and regional level and maybe even ability to modify it some depending mm -hmm. on local circumstances. Um, Representative Maffei. When you talk about the state maps, um, I'm getting a concept of these are the broader maps, kind of uh, a, a more of a, an outline or a grand design. And then when it comes down to either regional or local level, then they are refined by detail or what basically uh, they find is more appropriate to their own given mm -hmm. uh, situation. Right. Again, I would go back to the energy planning. Mm -hmm. The, the states identified what, what are called known and anticipated constraints. You know, and Charlie's here, he probably, oh, Charlie's <laughs> leaving. Um, <laughs> but he could probably tell you how that works at the regional level, because you know, we've all been going through that. So the states, again, define some, some resources and parameters at the state level that are incorporated in those maps. Then there's the option for communities and the region to also define both constraint areas where development shouldn't occur, but also where they prefer um, solar and wind projects to go. So there's also, you know, it's a balance of we don't want it here, but we want it there. Um, 
Well, in that situation, the state still has final approval, does it not? They do, and Act 250, Act 250 would still have final approval over projects that go through Act 250. Can you speak a little bit to, I think your town has um, gotten ahead or, or is, is working on compliance with mapping force blocks and habitat connectivity? Um, or if not your town, one you're familiar with it is. Well, actually my working? town and I, I, I it, as a planning consultant, I wrote the regulations for my town, and then when I wrote them, they made me the chair of the DRB. <laughs> it said, you, you did this, you've got to own it. <laughs> but we do have uh, regulations because Bolton's 96% forest. A lot of it's undevelopable. A lot of it, as you know, is very steep. Um, but we do, we have had quite a, most of our projects trigger, our subdivisions trigger our forest standards. And so basically our subdivision regulations are set up to require clustering and both require clustering on larger forest parcels. Um, we, re we require that the retained parcels for forestry are large enough to qualify for current use. Um, or I don't know, we, we try to require it, we strongly suggest it. And most, I mean, most applicants are fine with that because they want to benefit from the current use program. And that's 25 acres of forest. Yeah, forward. and that's our minimum lot size in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also require that they retain access to upland parcels. So if you have an upland parcel, and you subdivide for residential development down below, there's got to, we maintain logging access up so that. The, for forestry, not for. For forestry, right. And, and you know, and we've, we've spent, I will say, quite a bit of hearing time negotiating between residential and um, the A. Johnson Company owns a lot of upland area in Bolton and they're in there protecting their rights under the regs and so far I think it's benefited both the people because they know you know we, we don't want a logging road right up our driveway but we know it's going to happen in the area so yeah we've spent quite a bit of time on, the, on that specific issue dealing with forest land um, and I think there's ways to incorporate that again I don't know if they have to be in Act 250 in the standards but certainly in the guidance that's provided with Act 250 and the mapping um, there are ways to address those things mm -hmm. so those forest roads you mentioned were they uh, deeded roads right away a lot of them are well uh, I don't know if you've read the old deeds they basically well deed but that you know right away they have to have some they're, they don't define, one of the things we've been trying to do is, the deed will just say that you have rights to access the land for forestry. It doesn't say where, where the easement is. So when things come back through for subdivision, we actually say, okay, where's the forest road going? Mm -hmm. You know, and you got to show that on the plat too, so that everybody knows where it is. Um, because, yeah, the old deeds basically just granted general access over the property to get mm -hmm. to the forest land. Representative Dolan. Uh, I want to ask something mm -hmm. related more towards Bolton and the being of steep terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, what we discovered in our region is the impacts of private roads and driveways on municipal roads, yeah. delivering water, yep. blowing up our ditches. Does Bolton, or have you seen any experience where municipalities or even on the county level have been able to provide the right bylaw or guidance to be able to avoid those impacts <coughs> to municipalities, especially in our rural landscape yeah. when we're seeing that kind of fragmentation or development, we're seeing the impacts of that actually creating costs on the municipalities. And it's, it's really tough to do. In Bolton, we prohibit all development, including roads and driveways, on any slope that's over 25%. Um, we require, we actually allow for a maximum grade on our driveways of 15%, which is 5% over what the national standard is. Um, and we do that, but we require a huge amount of ditching and stone line ditching and stuff. The only, 
time we've been in court on our regulations is over our steep slope provisions and that was not a road or a driveway that was a four by four trail that we denied because they wanted to run basically we have a off-road driving school they run land rovers and stuff all over the ski area and they wanted to put in some trails that were over 25 percent because land rovers can apparently handle that <laughs> um, and we denied them and we said no you know because of water quality and erosion we don't want these up there and it went to court who won? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's, who won? Well, I would. Say it was. Me, it was negotiated out of, settled out of court, mm -hmm. and I would say that we lost because they're, they're allowed. Yeah, and it, it came up again in Act 250. Act 250 didn't really have good mm -hmm. uh, standards for regulating that kind of development, you know, in uh, steep areas. So. Act 250 imposed all kinds of monitoring requirements, but they couldn't deny it based on the fact that it was over 25%. They just said you have to do all this erosion stuff and you have to monitor the water quality down below. So that's a tough one. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. Good. Well, you know, if we can be of help, we're available. So thanks.